Hey guys, this is Nick, and in this video, I want to do an update to the Robinhood account hack. Originally, they said that the hack was limited to just a small number of accounts, but now they're saying about 2,000 accounts were hacked and had funds siphoned out of. Let's look at some of the details, and I'm going to talk about some of the things you can do to minimize your risk in situations like this. And I want to take a look back at the first internet bank called NetBank. And they're kind of a precursor to Robinhood, where Robinhood is like the first trading app. NetBank was the first internet only bank. And let's look at the problems they had and what ultimately happened to them. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen to Robinhood, but. There's a saying that the pioneers are the ones with the arrows in their backs. So if you originally went to Robinhood just because of the free trading, you might want to reconsider now because all the major full service online brokerages have free trading. So you're really not giving up anything and you get the full service of a live person that you can call um, and all kinds of other features that you don't get with Robinhood. So right now, a lot of Robinhood account holders are probably feeling like Homer Simpson in this episode right here. Wow, Dad, you're surfing like a pro. Oh, yeah. I'm betting on High Lie in the Cayman Islands. I invested in something called News Corp. Dad, that's Fox. Ah, undo, undo. Oh. Dad, do we have any money left? Well, let's... Oh, yes. Download to Papa. Yoink. Audio backslash losers. Now, originally, the Robin Hood spokesperson said, uh, tried to blame kind of the customers saying that their passwords weren't good or they used uh, same email address and passwords for multiple accounts. But... As Bloomberg notes that these users weren't just one off, but rather a large group of customers who had been compromised. Some users said they saw no signs of hacking and had two factor authentication enabled on their phones for extra protection. So there's something else that's going on here uh, more than just somebody's uh, email address getting hacked or using some crackable password or something because there are people that had 2FA and still got hacked. And this user said the 2FA stopped one person from accessing her account September 13th. And then after changing her password, her account was still hacked. And the next morning she woke up to a bunch of messages saying that, you know, all these stocks of hers were sold. She received no response from the company and was unable to find a customer service phone number. Now, in my previous video, uh, people that emailed the company got responses saying that they will look into it and respond in a few weeks. That's not the response you want to hear when you see somebody has your password and is selling your stocks and has set up um, transfers of money out of your account. Uh, then she got a call from Robinhood informing her somebody actually created a fake ID under her name to reactivate her account, which had already been locked down for security reasons. So these guys are pretty tenacious in their hacking and they're not, you know, they're going and getting fake IDs and everything. Another guy, Robert Riachi, said his account is still in limbo and that thousands of dollars had gone missing from his account that the company had assigned him 10 different case numbers even after submitting his ID to try and straighten out the issue. He had four years of savings in his account and said he will move to Schwab when he gets his money back. And he said, I feel like the money could be put somewhere else, somewhere that has a human person that I can talk to. It's kind of ridiculous that an investment app that's handling people's livelihoods, people's money, has the audacity to make people wait several weeks to hear back anything. Another guy, Bill Hurley, who lost 5,000 from the same type of hack, simply said last week that Robin Hood has had more than enough time to deal with this. So people are really getting unhappy with this. And like I said in the previous video, there's really no reason not to go to these other brokerages because 
They have free trading as well. I mean, Robinhood paved the way for that, but now everybody's doing it and they have a lot more services for, you know, no, no extra money. So why not do it? And just to be clear, <laughs> uh, not that I don't trust Robinhood completely. Uh, I also don't trust any of the other brokerages completely. So I have multiple accounts and I would recommend if you had a good amount of money, uh, spread it out between different brokerages and just go to any of the big ones. You know, Schwab's merging with Ameritrade. So either Schwab or Ameritrade or Fidelity or Vanguard or Interactive Brokers, um, any of those are fine. So definitely look into them. And now let's go take a look at the first internet bank, NetBank, which went public <laughs> with 15 employees around 1997 and went priced at $12 and went as high as like $80 or something. Now there was a story on them in Forbes in 1998 saying how great they were and all this stuff. But, uh, you know, they bragged about how they had no brick and mortar stores and how it was cheaper than that, you know, for them to operate. And so because of that, they can give customers better interest rates. So kind of like how Robinhood says, hey, we have no brick and mortar locations, so we can give you free trading where the others can't. And so in this article, they say, a Citibank customer needs a 6,000 balance to collect 1% interest on a checking account. NetBank's minimum is $100 and the account pays 4%. So they were paying much more than the other banks. And I actually remember this bank and I either opened an account with them or I was going to open an account with them just because of the novelty of being an internet bank and everything is over the internet. But um, I don't know what happened. I might have, I might not have, but I know that uh, what might have stopped me was that everything you did with them, you had to send in a check by mail. There was none of this taking a photograph of your check and depositing or anything like that. So um, it really hampered you a lot. And uh, see, so you, you had to deposit all paper checks by mail <laughs> and use other banks' automatic teller machines. And so, you know, you would have to pay the ATM fees on those banks and everything. So it, it was a good idea, but not very practical at the time. And eventually, you know, other banks got into online banking, bigger banks, Citibank, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. So there really was no reason to stick with these little banks with probably no customer service at all. I don't even remember if there was a number you can call or whatever. Um, but that's the thing, you know, these these small these small startups, they have a good idea, but the big the big companies can copy them eventually. And a lot of people switch to that because it makes more sense to do so. And so whatever happened to NetBank? <laughs> well, <laughs> NetBank was closed by the feds in 2007. Uh, at the time, it was the largest bank failure in Georgia history. So it eventually liquidated in bankruptcy. The stock <laughs> went to trade on the pink sheets with the Q symbol, which means it's, it's trading in bankruptcy. And down here, it says it was trading at one cent. So this stock went public at $12, went to $80, and ended up at a penny. I'm not saying that's going to happen with Robinhood, but... Um, it's good to know your history of some of these things. And just to show you that there is real risk in banks and brokerages, even though they have insurance, you see here, ING bought the 1.5 billion of their insured non-brokered deposits for a 1% premium. However, NetBank had about $100 million in 1,500 deposit accounts that exceeded FDIC insurance limit <laughs> okay so these customers will get up to their fdic insured amount but everything above that 109 million worth over 1500 accounts those people will now become creditors in the receivership for the amount of their uninsured funds 
So what that means is you get your FDIC 250,000, but if you have more than that, then you're waiting online and getting pennies on the dollar when they liquidate uh, NetBank. And <laughs> what exactly is there to liquidate when there's no banks, no ATM machines, no nothing? Uh, what is a couple Dell computers, a few servers maybe? Um, so that is the risk and so i'm not saying robin hood's going out of business or anything like that they are sipc insured which is not a federal insurance uh scheme by the way it is a brokerage industry insurance scheme so um i'm not saying robin hood is better or worse than any other brokerages although i would trust a, a schwab of a fidelity a vanguard way more than robin hood um, but that just goes to prove my point that you really should diversify into multiple brokerage accounts and mo multiple bank accounts as well. So that's what you should do <laughs> if you're a Robinhood account holder. Look to some of these other brokerages and check out their features. See which ones are best for your needs and open up another one or two accounts it costs you basically nothing to do it and no monthly fees and all that stuff a lot of them are much better than actual banks because they don't have minimum account balances and fees and you know bank uh schwab has a bank that has a bank card that you could use atms all over the world and you get your atm fees refunded and all this stuff so every one of them has some features that are are, are really good and and some people might like one feature over the other so that's my look at the robin hood account hack and what you can do to protect yourself and limit your risk because there's risk in all of these things so remember that if you like this video give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel thanks for watching guys